First Peter chapter one, chapter two rather. We're on a series on the names of Jesus Christ. How befitting this time of year that we should study the names of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the name above every name. It is the name that was announced and given. And it is the name by which we must be saved. We need to know a little bit about that name. Even Christians a lot of times forget the power that's in that name. There's so much power in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You want to get a response from people, just start talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to get people to get riled up, stirred up, upset, angry, happy, joyful, crying, sad, mad, all beside themselves, all in one bunch, just mention the name of Jesus Christ. And the name of Jesus Christ will separate the sheep from the wolves. It will separate the chafe from the wheat. It will make you understand who is in the light and who is in the dark. Amen. All you got to do is mention the name of Jesus Christ. You can mention the name of Buddha and nobody blinks an eye. You can mention the name of Muhammad, nobody cares. But when you mention that name Jesus, everybody stops and pays attention. They either love that name or they hate it, but there's no neutral ground. Nobody's neutral when it comes to the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Nobody. You get in a room full of people and you start talking about the name, you'll watch people start getting nervous. You'll start watching people getting upset, uncomfortable. Uh, my, look at where the time is going. We've got to get out of here. And uh, I forgot I had an appointment. You know, I, I'm over there working where I work as a, on a federal facility. And uh, a lot of times people come in and that name will come up because they see me read my Bible. And, of course, they'll strike up conversations. And then, of course, in a place like that, you've got both believers and unbelievers coming in and out of that place. And, and some of those unbelievers, when they start hearing you talk about the name of Jesus Christ and who he is and what he is and what he did for you, they get very uh, uncomfortable. Amen. Same way in churches. The reason a lot of people in church don't get uncomfortable anymore is because the preachers have stopped preaching the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. They, stopped, they started playing politics and uh, they started playing entertainment programs and things of that nature. They stopped preaching the truth. Amen. First Peter chapter 2. We're going to talk about a specific thing concerning the name of the Lord today. Today we're going to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. The chief cornerstone. And we're going to talk about what that means. 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verse 1. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking. And you pay attention to that? Boy, I wish some Christians would pay attention to that verse. Look at that verse again. He said to lay aside all malice. He said to lay aside all guile. He said all hypocrisies. Stop being a hypocrite. Stop pretending to be something that you're not. If you're saved, own up to it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. If you're saved, stop hiding behind the bushes. Let people know what you are. They know what you are anyway. You can't hide it. I remember when I got out of the will of God and out there running around in the clubs trying to hide behind the booze and the strobe lights and the dark uh, theaters and stuff. And I remember getting in those places and sitting down and talking to those people in there and trying to hide, you know, and pretend to be something that I want. And, and those people would start talking to me and inevitably, inevitably. Are you listening to me now? Are you listening? Very carefully. Listen to me now. In some of the darkest clubs you could ever imagine, I was sitting there and getting half drunk with these people, and we would inevitably start talking about Jesus Christ. Why do you suppose that is? It's in your heart. It's what's in your heart. And they'd look at me, Brother Earl, and they'd say, there's something different about you. You don't belong in here. I haven't tell me that. What are you doing here? <laughs> 
man, there's something strange about you. <laughs> Stop, lay aside the hypocrisies and let people know what you are. You see, Peter tried to do that. He tried to warm himself by the fire. He tried to hide and blend in with the crowd. And the crowd started talking to him and they were listening to the way he was talking. Your speech is betraying you. You're one of his. So you can't hide it if it's real. If it's inside of you, folks, it will come out. Amen. And I'll tell you something else. If it ain't inside of you, that'll come out too. Amen. If it's not in you, it will be revealed. And people will recognize that there's nothing to what that guy's got. Amen. The Bible says here, envies and all evil speakings. As newborn babes desire, this is a command, notice how it's written, desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. Have you ever noticed that? I've heard some people read that verse and say, well, it's, it's talking about babies desiring the sincere milk of the word. No, it's not. Read the verse again very carefully. It says, as newborn babes, and then he tells you something, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. He's telling you a command. You as a born again Christian are to desire the sincere milk of the word of God. The Bible says, if so be that you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Is he gracious in your life? Yes. He sure is in mine. Let me tell you something, folks. I've been battling some stuff this week between churches, uh, services, and I mean, I was bedridden there for two days. <clears throat> I couldn't even talk. My voice was gone. I mean, um, it, it took God to get my voice back. And in that time, all I could do is say, Lord, please help me. Have you tasted to see that the Lord is gracious? Boy, I have. I've watched God take and put people in the bed and, and raise them up out of the bed. Amen. The Bible says, to whom, as a, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed even indeed of, build, of men, rather, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as living stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Look at verse 6 real carefully. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a what? A chief cornerstone. Isn't that interesting? Elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. Watch it. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Now I want to talk about this chief cornerstone today. This chief cornerstone. What is a cornerstone? It is a stone which lies at the corner of two walls. Get a picture here of two walls and unites them. It is the principal stone and especially the stone which forms the corner of the foundation of an edifice. It is also referred to as a foundation stone and a setting stone. It is the first stone set in the construction of a foundation. All other stones will be set in reference to this stone, thus determining the position of the entire structure. When building, your cornerstone must be set straight and it must be level. Your foundation has to be done correctly or you are wasting your time. You always start in the corner with the cornerstone. If you don't, your building and wall will be crooked and collapse. And did you pay attention to what I just read? Now Jesus is said to be the cornerstone. In other words, whatever you're building in your life, 
is going to be determined by whatever cornerstone that you start with. And if you do not start with Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, your building is going to wind up collapsing. Your structure is going to wind up not being straight and level. It's going to be crooked. It's going to be cattywampus. And it's going to fall apart. You must start with the correct procedure. And you must start with a perfectly level cornerstone. If that cornerstone is not the right cornerstone, you're going to be making a building that's going to wind up being shaky. And I'm concerned today that a lot of churches today have started using and building with the wrong cornerstone. They are not starting with Jesus Christ. They are starting with gimmicks. They're starting with entertainment. They're starting with the world's methods. They're starting with the world's ways. And therefore, their building is becoming more and more corrupt and more and more wicked. And now when you go in places and churches and places and houses of worship, you don't even think you're in a church anymore. Right. Amen. Amen. Right. They've taken the altar out, brother. The altar's not even there. I'll tell you something else they've taken out. They've taken out the communion tables. We don't need that anymore. He said, those are not really significant things, preacher. You better believe they are. When you take an altar out of a church, you've taken the prayer out of the church. Because the altars is where you get saved, and the altars is where you get right with God. Amen. Tell you what else they've taken out of churches. They've replaced the pews and put in the padded little uh, theater chairs. Why? Because they're looking to be entertained. See, they're not looking to the cornerstone anymore, Jesus Christ. They've got another stone that they're using. And it's a worldly stone that's building a different structure. See? Used to be when you would pass down the road, you could look at places and you say, That's a church. That's a church. That's a theater. That's the office building. Now, when you drive around and look at places, you can't tell the difference between any of them. Ain't it something? We have stopped making a difference, a distinction between the holy and the profane. See? We want to be like the world. Ain't that what Israel said? We want to be like the other nations. We want a king just like they've got. We want to be like them. We need a king. Samuel, give us a king. Samuel said, the Lord's your king. No, we don't need that king. We need a, an earthly king. We need a physical king. We need to be like over here, you know, the, the uh, Philistines. They have a king. We won't be like them. The Canaanites, they got a king. We, we like the way they got that thing set up over there. We're going to try to be like them. Samuel went before the Lord with that thing. And Samuel cried all night before the Lord like preachers should be doing when this stuff starts happening in churches. And he came before the Lord and he said, Lord, why are they rejecting you? <clears throat> and the Lord said, they've rejected me. Give them what they want. Give them their king. But here's the manner of the king. He's going to be unlike anything they want. He's going to be a tyrant. He's going to cause them to be their, his servants. See? Be careful what you ask for because the Lord just might give it to you. Yeah. Amen. Be careful with that. Another thing that you want to know is about the headstone. Now, this is another name that we'll look at later. A headstone is the principal stone in a foundation. It's the chief or the cornerstone. Another thing that also uh, the scriptures describe is a thing called a pillar. How many of you have heard and seen in your Bible and read the word pillar? P-I-L-L-A-R. All right. It's a supporter. That which sustains or upholds that on which some of the sub, uh, superstructure rests. These are going to become very important as we read the scriptures. Go over here to Ephesians chapter 2. <coughs> Excuse me. Ephesians chapter 2. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 2, let's look at verse 19. Verse 19. 
2.19. The Bible says here in verse 19, he says, Now therefore, you are no more strangers and foreigners. He's talking to these Gentiles in the church here at Ephesus. He says, You are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. In other words, y'all have been grafted in. Y'all are part of the same superstructure now. You are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Watch it. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in which all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. A couple of things I want you to notice here. It's got to start with Jesus. Again, this verse points that out and makes that very clear. He is the chief cornerstone. You must start with the Lord, folks. You cannot start with, I was raised a Baptist. I was raised a Methodist. Well, God don't give a flip about what denomination you are. God cares about what you started with in your spiritual structure and if you started with Jesus Christ or not. And I'll tell you a sure way to know whether you started with the Lord Jesus Christ or not, you'll start with His book. What is it? It's the King James Bible. That is the foundation. And if you don't have a King James Bible, bless your heart, you need to get you one. Amen. Because that's where the structure is built. The Bible says here, in the next part, it says, All the building fitly framed together groweth. Groweth. Notice that. It's a building that is continuously growing out and up. Ain't that interesting? Now these buildings out here, they don't you have to tear something down to make it bigger. But God's building just continues to grow. Because it's living stones that are in that building. Jesus Christ is the living stone. And He is the one that sustains the building, feeds the building, grows the building. Remember. The Bible says in the book of Acts that the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Who added to the church? The Lord. Not me. All I can do is preach the gospel to people. All I can do is point you in the right direction. But I cannot save anybody. Amen. I cannot save you. Only God can save you. Only Jesus Christ can put you in the body. Why? Because He knows what's in the heart. I don't. I can make assumptions based on what I hear and what I see, you know. I can look at people and say, well, they look very contrite today. You know, they got under conviction and they came forward in the altar call and, and gave their heart to Christ. I believe that. But honestly, I don't know that. See? I don't know anybody in this building's heart. Amen. Only God knows your heart. He's the one that owns and possesses you if you're saved. You belong to Him. I am an under-shepherd. Anybody know what that is? You got the chief shepherd and then the under-shepherd. The one that's helping the Lord out with the sheep. A pastor, that's what the word pastor is. It means shepherd. All right, The pastor or the bishop is the one that's kind of gathering in the flock and, and, and feeding the flock. That's what the pastor should be doing. He should not be out entertaining people. The Bible says here that it's growing unto a holy temple in the Lord. A holy temple. See? The way you know you're plugged up to the right cornerstone is whether the building is holy or not. You got a bunch of people in the church that are unholy, the chances are the cornerstone is not the right cornerstone. Because if they're plugged up to the right cornerstone, Jesus Christ, they'll be holy. Why? Because God is holy. Christians are called to holiness, not uncleanness. <clears throat> we're built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. All right, let's go back to 1 Peter again, chapter 2. Let's look at those verses again. Y'all hearing me okay? 
right. First Peter chapter 2, let's look at it at verse 6. Let's start down here at verse 6. The Bible says, Wherefore also is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. Notice that God is the one that laid the cornerstone. He's the one that set the standard. He's the one that laid it out there. He said elect. You know what that means? That means chosen. Precious. Let me ask you something. Is Jesus precious to you? Yes. Yes. I tell you, a lot of people, he's not precious to them. I was reading on the internet yesterday, uh, 25 people that you didn't, may, may not know were not were that, uh, in the entertainment business that were atheists. I looked through that list and I said, these bunch of infidels. None of them surprised me. <laughs> and, and the majority of them will wind up dead before they're 50. Amen. Because when you start out with a blank, you'll end up with a blank. Amen. The Bible says he's precious. And he that believeth on him, not in him, notice that, on him. You know what that means? That means to trust him. That means that I'm putting my faith and trust in what he did for me. Shall not be confounded. That word confounded means not to be confused. We live in a very confusing world. Up is down and down is up. Men are women and women are men. They got it in schools now where they're teaching them all these binary names and pronouns and stuff, you know. What do you prefer to be called? He, she, it, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> God knows what else. Tranny 1, tranny 2, tranny 3, ABC 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. You know, and tomorrow will be something different. Very confusing. But I'm going to tell you something. When you start out with God, and you start out with His Word, and you believe what God has said in that book, there is no confusion about what is right and what is wrong, what is true and what is a lie, and what is a man and what is a woman, and what is up and what is down, what is light and what is dark. Because God has made it clear, and God has not changed His mind, and He will never change His mind. He will put the truth out there, whether you like it or not. Lump it, sweetheart. If you don't, uh, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Amen. The Bible says here, Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient. Notice he uses the term disobedient in contrast to belief. Did you notice that? And the reason he uses that is because when you don't believe on Christ, Brother Chuck, and you refuse to trust him, you by default are being disobedient to the command to believe on the Lord. Because that is a command. God expects you to believe on His Son. God has given you the command that you are to trust Jesus Christ for your salvation or else you're going to hell. There ain't no maybe so about it. Well, how can you be so sure about that? Because i got a Bible that's sure. Amen. i got a book that tells me what's right and wrong and I don't have to guess. If you don't trust Jesus Christ, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You're going straight to hell. There's no purgatory. There's no limbo. There's no left turn. And there's no second chance. I'd get saved if I were you. The Bible says here that ye which are disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. What does that mean? Let me show you what that means. You see that head of the corner there? I'll show you what that means. Now he's giving you a, an allusion to something. You know what it is? It's an allusion to a structure down in Egypt that nobody can seem to figure out who built the thing. But if they had a Bible, they would know who put the thing there. And if they had a Bible, they would know that it's God's symbol. And the world has took that symbol and duplicated it, and counterfeited it. You say, what's the symbol, preacher? The symbol, the, the, the symbol is this. It's right here. 
See that right there? What's that right there? A pyramid. That's a pyramid. Triangle pyramid. That's God's symbol. When God told the children of Israel that He was going to give them a land grant, guess what it's in the shape of? That. He said, I'm going to take you down to the river Euphrates down here. And I'm going to get you to go all the way up to Ur, the Chaldees, up here. And then I'm going to bring you down to the great river over here. And you're going to draw you a line and you're going to walk that thing, Abraham. And everywhere your foot walks, I'm going to give you that piece of land. And right now, Israel is in this little piece right here. And that's all they got right now. But God said, I'm going to give them from this up here to this down here. And I'm going to go from here to here. And I'm going to go all the way over here. That means every Arab, towelhead, Muslim, uh, Freak over there has got to get out of town. When God gets done, they're going to have a piece of land that's bigger than anything you could ever imagine. God's going to give it to them. And when Jesus Christ is said the head of the corner, there's only one structure in the Bible that is the head of the corner. You know what it is? It's this right here. The head of the corner is the top of a pyramid. It's called a headstone. Or you can hear it called a capstone. How many of you have seen it like this before? With an eyeball in there. On the dollar bill. The all-seeing eye, you know. I told you, Satan's got a counterfeit. He's mocking the fact that Jesus Christ is the head of the corner. See? He's the capstone on top of that pyramid. And if you study the history of that pyramid, you'll find out that that capstone up there, when it was made, Brother Jack, was made of pure gold. They went back later and stripped it and took all the gold off the top of the thing. Jesus is said to be the head of the corner to those that are disobedient. What does that mean? When that thing comes down and lands on the ground, folks... Anything that's under that thing is going to be crushed. That's what he's giving you the picture of there. Jesus is likened to that headstone coming down on top of the ground and grinding anything that's under it. And if anything falls on top of that thing, guess what's going to happen to them? They're going to be pierced. They're going to be cut in two. Because the top of that thing's pointing. You know the universe is set up like that? You know what the top of the universe is? It's set up like this right here. At the top of your universe that you look out there and look up at the sky at, you look up there and uh, you find the North Star and you look straight up in there, the top of that thing's got a hole in it. Jesus wore a poncho, a seamless coat. And that thing was shaped like that right there. And it had holes over here for his arms to come out of on each side. And a hole in the top for his head to come out at the top, which would be the top of the head there. The universe is set up just like that. Satan said, I'm going to go to the sides of the north. Right there. That's the sides of the north. And he goes to the top of that thing, but there's a frozen deep up here that keeps you from getting to the top of that hole where God is up here. See, God's up at the top here. The universe is set up like that too. Everything that God does, He does with things like this in mind. He does things in threes, right? What do we say here? We say Father, right? We say Son, right? We say Holy Ghost, right? How many of you believe in the Trinity? Let me see your hands. <laughs> Alright. Well, guess what? This is God right here. Right? Now, the Father is God. The Holy Ghost is God. The Son is God. But guess what? The Son is not the Father and the Father is not the Son. So God has a symbol that shows you that reality. It's a pyramid. About that. So you know what the world does? I'll show you what the world does. They take that symbol. Where's my rag at? Old devil's trying to steal my rag. Alright. Here's what the world does. They take that same symbol. You see this right here? You know who does this? The queers. 
That's their symbol. An upside down triangle. Pink. Adolf Hitler made them wear it during the Holocaust. How about this one? You ready? I'm going to make some of you music fans mad. Dark side of the moon. How many of you have heard of it? The moon. They use that symbol. Huh? How about it? You see, these symbols mean something. And the devil and the world knows they mean something. You find them in the King James Bible. We're going to be looking at this a little bit more here as we go along. Don't get mad. <laughs> just, just pray about it. Alright, take your Bible and let's keep moving along here now. This chief cornerstone was laid in Zion and called elect and precious. The builders, the Jews, rejected this chief cornerstone. He became the head of the corner. The term means the stone on which the entire structure ultimately relies on to remain upright. The leader's rejection could not stop what God set up. They, the Jews as a nation, will have to come to this cornerstone to be made right. That happens in the tribulation. Until they do, they will stumble over him, and he becomes to them, guess what? A rock of offense. Go to uh, Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8. A rock. That's why Jesus is called a rock in the Bible. That term rock there is a term used for Jesus Christ. So the world comes back and guess what they do? They take those terms and they twist them and they pervert them. What do they do, Sister Carolyn? Rock and roll. See? They take those terms that apply to Jesus Christ and they, and they flip them. And they push them in a different direction. They counterfeit what God is doing. What does the world do in the religious spirit? They say, oh, we've got a rock, Brother Jack. His name is Peter. So we set up the whole church under the rock, which is Peter. Counterfeit. He's not the rock. Jesus is. Just like Elvis wasn't the king. Jesus is. And if Elvis was alive today, he'd tell you that. He did that many times in his shows. A lot of people don't talk about that, though. They don't, they don't, they don't bring that up. And they got a name for him, so they, got, they don't go with the narrative, so they, they edit out those kind of things. All right. I believe Elvis was saved despite his mess. You know, I think he just got off on the wrong crowd and... Got out of fellowship with the Lord and the devil used him to do a lot of bad stuff. You look over here at Isaiah chapter 8 verse 13. The Bible says here in verse 13, Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself and let him be your what? You don't fear people. You fear God. See, there's two types of fear. There's the fear of man and there's the fear of God. One brings a snare and the other is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is to depart from evil. A man cannot tell you he fears God and yet de delves out there in wickedness and evil. It don't work that way. A man that's out there playing around in evil is not a man that fears God. A man that fears God stays away from evil. We are to fear God. That is the beginning of wisdom. What is the what is the conclusion of the matter, Ecclesiastes says? Fear God and keep his commandments. But fear man? Mm -mm. I don't fear people. I don't fear them. I know some preachers that do. They're scared to get up and tell you the truth on Sunday morning because they're scared you're going to stop paying your tithes. Amen. They're scared that they're going to lose their congregations. They're scared they're going to offend somebody and they're going to run out and they're going to lose their crowd. You know what they are? They're people pleasers. They're hirelings. 
The Bible says, Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread, and he shall be for a sanctuary and for a what? Of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. How about that? He's going to be, now look at what it says next. It says, and many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. But look at what he tells next. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. See? In other words, don't change what you're preaching. Protect the scriptures. Don't change them. Don't mess with them, Brother Earl. Let them say what they're going to say, and if they don't like what they're going to say, you get that book in a place that's safe and secure from the infidels. All right. Another thing to note in this passage is how unbelief is defined as disobedient. We talked about that earlier. All right. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 5, we looked at Jesus is referred to as a living stone. As born-again believers, we also are referred to as living stones and part of the structure of a spiritual house, referred to in other places as the temple of the Lord. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. You are a temple. Now, you're either a good temple or a bad temple. But you're a temple. And you're either a temple for God or you're a temple for the devil. See, Satan is a religious man. Did you know that? I had a conversation with two different families this week, and we were talking about the difference between somebody that's religious and somebody that's spiritual. And there is a difference, folks, and you better know the difference. A religious person knows how to cut it on and cut it off, and they know how to be religious when they need to be, and they know how to be worldly when they need to be, and it's not in their heart to be spiritual, and it'll show in their mouth. But a man that's spiritual, whatever's in this right here will come out here. And it don't have to be forced. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Boy, what a way to start a Sunday morning, huh? 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 19. We sure don't know what Brother Mark's going to say. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. What? Know you not that your body, ladies, gentlemen, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God. And read that next part, please. I want you to memorize that. You know why? Because a lot of Christians say, ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. You better pay attention to that verse because you don't belong to you. You belong to God. Like it or not, it is what it is. You, after you got saved, belong to Jesus Christ, and He is the one that has to say over what you do and what you don't do. And if you don't like it, I'll tell you what He can do. He can put you flat on your back where you'll still do what you got to do. I know what I'm talking about. And if you belong to the devil, guess what? The same thing applies. I would never do anything like that person did. I'd never go where they go. Two years later, after the devil's pumped a bunch of trash into them through the internet and through the TikTok and the Twitter and the Instagram, they're doing things beyond their wildest dreams that they would have said they never would have done two or three years before that. Don't you tell me what you will and won't do. I'll tell you something. If you belong to the devil, (coughs) the devil will take a hold of you anytime he gets good and ready and he'll make you do things you never thought you would do. The best thing for you to do is give your heart to Jesus Christ and let Him be control of your body. Amen. Amen. I've watched young women tell me that they wouldn't do what so-and-so down the road doing, hold their nose up at them, and I would try to plead with them about getting saved, and they reject the gospel of Jesus Christ too. Three years later, I go to those same people. They're out there prostituting. You wouldn't even recognize them, brother. From two years before. Twenty year old women looking like they're sixty. 
Amen. Same thing with the men. I tell you what, there's a message I heard when I was growing up, and it stands true, and I've preached it before, and I'll probably preach it again sometime. Sin will take you further than you ever want to go. It'll take you places you never thought you would go. It'll make you do things you never thought you would do. It'll make you think things you never thought you would think. I go to the jails and I go to the prisons. I have men come to me in tears after getting saved and say, Preacher, when I was growing up, I wish to God I'd have had a godly family. I never thought I would be in a place like this. I never thought I would do the things that I did that got me to this place. But preacher, the sin of this world and the deception of Satan took me further than I ever thought I could ever go. Then why? Because he had control of me. Whether it be through drugs, whether it be through alcohol, it doesn't matter. Take your picky vice, it don't matter. If he can't get you one way, he'll get you another. If he can't get you through sex, he'll get you through TV. If he can't get you through TV, he'll get you through the industry. If he can't get you through the industry, he'll get you through drugs. He'll get you through meth. He'll get you through God knows what. He, you just take your pick. He knows how to push the right buttons to figure you out. He's had 6,000 years of practice. Amen. The only hope, the only cure is Jesus Christ. He's the one that can fix this. And this is what Paul is talking about. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God? You are not your own. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. Why? Because if you don't, the devil will get in there and he will mess you up. Amen. He'll mess you up good. Take your Bible and go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I don't even know what time it is. Ooh, we are way past time. <laughs> Chapter 6, verse 16. We'll close with this one. And we'll pick up there next week. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, 16. Write that one down, Carrie. That's the last verse we looked at. We'll pick it up next week. Verse 16 says, In what agreement... At the temple of God with idols. For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore come out. Look at this, look at this in contrast here now. Because you are the temple of the living God. He says what he says in verse 17. Separation is still biblical. Holiness is still demanded by God. God wants you to be clean. He wants you to be holy. He wants you to be separate from the world. Look at it. Wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And what next? Touch not the unclean thing. You know what happens when you touch the unclean thing? It gets a hold of you and it will destroy you. I got a brother right now that called me in the middle of the night and he begged me to go over there to that house that I grew up in on the tram road and pray over that house. Why did he want me to pray over that house? Because strange things were going on in that house. And when I got over there in that house, I said, Brother, I'll pray over this house under one condition. He said, What's that? If I find anything in this house that's ungodly, you got to agree with me to get rid of it. He said, All right, we'll get rid of it. I said, Get your boxes out. I started going through that house and I started praying over that house. I said, this has got to go. 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 We get out there in the yard and I'm praying around the yard, Brother Rocky, and that little dog that he had that he had going with him, he was riding right beside me. And as we're praying over the yard, I get to the barn. And there's a dark presence that hangs over that place. It's still there today. Because the things that they were told to do, they didn't do. It's got a foothold in there. And I got to that barn, and I looked at that barn, and there was something wicked and dark and evil staring back at me. And that dog, when he looked at that barn, he sat down, and he looked in that barn, and he started growling. And I looked at my brother. He was still sitting on the porch looking in that direction. I said, what is in that barn? 
You know what his companion said? Smiling. Oh, that, there's a Ouija board in there that my daddy played with. Oh, a Ouija board. And it was sitting right there in that barn. And they made light of the fact that it was there. I said, you get that thing out of there and you burn it. Because if you don't get rid of that thing, this entity, this thing, this whatever's going on out here, because what they had happened in that house, folks, was anything like you've seen on the exorcism or poltergeist. Doors were shutting. The little kid in the house was talking to this dark figure that had no face that was trying to eat him. That little kid was only, I forgot how old, uh, how old is the young man, he was five or six, seven? He's six. He, he was about four at that time. He would look at me in that room and he would tell me, he said, I'm evil, Uncle Donnie. I'm evil. What four-year-old says that? You play with evil, folks. Evil will get a hold of your family. It will destroy you. It will destroy you. Come out from among them, said the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. God says, I will receive you under one condition. You get rid of that that's unclean. I am clean, and I will not touch anything unclean. And you as a born-again Christian ought to take note of that and understand that and not fool around with that stuff. Now, I don't know who this message is for today. But God's preaching. Amen. He's the cornerstone. You've got to start with Jesus Christ. Get the thing at the foundation right first. And then the rest of the building will be set up like it needs to be. And then keep out everything that is wicked. You've got to get rid of those satanic entity things that they attach to things. Amen. <laughs> I ain't talking about something I learned in seminary somewhere. I'm talking about something that I've experienced in my own life. I grew up in that house. I've seen things happen over there. I go over there right now. I can bring you anybody in this building over there right now and tell you to look over in that yard and you tell me what you see. And most people that I've done that with have said there's something dark hanging over there. Right now, daylight goes way back the devil is not going to give up his ground easy it takes a born again Christian that's determined to live for God to get it out I pray over this property out here when I got it my friend let me tell you something I go, over, I, go I went from corner to corner of this place and I walked around this place brother Earl's been around this place a few different times with me I mean we pray brother there's angels standing around this place Daring any evil spirit to come up in here. There's <laughs> going to be some warfare going on. Amen. And there has been evil in here and it is no longer here. And it leaves quick. It don't stay long. You can't stay in this place unless you're right. Amen. Amen. That's right. I ain't saying that cocky. I'm saying that reality. Amen. I'm saying that because of this. God's here. Amen. All right, we'll close right there and we'll pick up there next week. The cornerstone, folks. He's the cornerstone. I'm glad he is. I'm glad he's my cornerstone. I'm glad he's this church's cornerstone. Praise God. And this church has started back in 2012 and, and, and we made sure that God was the cornerstone and this book was the cornerstone. I mean, this book was the foundation of everything we build on. We may not be the biggest church in town, but I tell you something, when you come here, you're going to get something from God. Amen. Amen. Thank God for it. Let's close in prayer. Brother Jack, close us in prayer this morning, brother. Lord, we just thank you. Thank you, Lord. Praise and thank you, Lord God, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. We thank God that you touch more today. Yes, Lord. And we pray God that you would work in the hearts and 
minds of the, the ones that hear it. In Jesus. We pray, God, that they would be born again. Yes, Lord. And we just praise you and thank you and ask God to bring us back to the next point in time. We praise you and thank you in the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise Amen. His holy and righteous name. Amen. Keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed for a minute. If there's somebody in here in this building that I don't know, I don't know where you are spiritually. I just want to give you an opportunity if you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and you want to get that thing straight this morning, we'll help you. We'll pray for you. We won't embarrass you. I want to see your hand this morning. I want to pray for you. Say, Preacher, I need Jesus in my life and this message really stirred me up today and I want to get my heart right with God this morning. Will you pray for me? Is there one? I see that hand. I see that hand. All right. Now, is there anybody else? Now, if you're here and you're not saved, and you want to get saved this morning, this is the place to be. You might be saved here this morning, but you've strayed. You've gotten away from what you need to be in the Lord. If that's you this morning, can I see your hand? I want to pray for you. I see that hand. I see that hand. Now, I want to pray for you this morning. I see that hand. Yes. Hands going up. Now, God's moving in here this morning. I felt Him as He's just beginning to walk these aisles and walk these pews and walk on these hearts. This is the place to be. This is God's operating table. He's going to make you better this morning now. Those who raised their hands this morning, I want you to pray this prayer from the heart. And mean it. I'm not going to ask you to come up here to the front this morning, but I'm going to have you to pray right where you're at in your pew this morning. You and God. Now you pray this from the heart. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I come before you this morning and I rededicate my walk with you. And I ask you to give me the strength to walk in your truth and in your word and as I rededicate myself to you I want to walk as a filled with the Holy Ghost Christian full of the word of God and put you first in everything I say and do help me Lord to be what I ought to be for you in Jesus name now, did you pray that prayer this morning from the heart let me see your hands Yes, I see those hands. Okay. Now walk in it. The Bible says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now Lord, as I pray over this congregation one more time this morning, I pray God that you'll take our sins that we've committed on a daily basis and we lay them on this altar this morning and we ask God for your forgiveness. We ask God for your cleansing. We ask God for your purging. Lord, it will stay right with you. Lord, we'll stay humble before you. Lord, we'll stay in the fear of the Lord and walk in the grace of God in all things. We ask it in Jesus' name. Keep us safe till we come together again. In Jesus' name, amen.